Hello, the title of this talk is Developmental and Body Agents as Metabrain Models. My name is Bradley Alicia, and I'm presenting with five co-authors, Stefan Dvoretsky, Zee Gong, Anka Gupta, Sam Felder, and Jesse Parent. Uh, now, I'd like to start with an overarching theme, and that is the idea of metabrain models. And so metabrain models are these models that have two different components in them, a representation-free and a representational-rich component. The representation-free component relies solely on the structure found in the empirical world. And these are things like brain bird vehicles and neural networks. On the other hand, representation-rich components map the empirical world to a set of signs or interpretive criteria. And that's represented by contextual geometric structures. And these two different uh, components are combined into a single model. And they can com be combined in different ways. It can be combined as a layer, or they can be combined as uh, some quasi-separate thing, and we'll talk about how that can be done in a bit. The first part of this is the representational free model, and that's represented by the Breitenberg vehicle. So the Breitenberg vehicle is a first-order stimulus response mapping, and as you can see, the Breitenberg vehicle observes the empirical world, and it's hardwired internally to elicit a certain response to that stimulus. So we have a sun in the sky, which is a light source, and the vehicle is designed to either repel from that source or be attracted to that source. So in that way, the vehicle yields a type of taxis or reflect, reflexive behavior. And we know about taxis from uh, ethology, and we know that those things are generally pretty simple behaviors. So this is all generated by a very simple neural network that is also embodied. So the effects of the, the body in this are explicit. We've taken this a step further to go towards something called developmental brain bird vehicles. And these can be achieved in a number of ways, as we'll see in this talk. But one key component that unites all of the approaches is this thing called connectivity activation encoding. And that's denoted by WIJ. And WIJ is a matrix. And imagine this matrix is populated by values that represent the connections between nodes in, in the nervous system. And so this uh, matrix can be expanded or can be pruned depending on the number of connections at the time. So you can have I, I, uh, matrix values ij, they can either grow in size or shrink in size, or their values can change. So you can have a sparser matrix or a more populated matrix. And so those things represent changes in the nervous system. And so we've achieved this sort of operate, these operations with two different methods. Uh, the first is heavy and learning. So heavy and learning is where you modify a matrix using layer together, fire together rules to create viable spatially explicit multimodal associations. The second are genetic algorithms, which create mass topological reorderings of these networks and selection of viable matrices through mutation and recombination, plus a fitness function. So you can see our matrix here in graphical form. You can see that there's a simple mapping between sensors and effectors. And in this case, it's not so simple because we've taken the simple mapping in most brain bird vehicles, a line going straight from sensor to effector, and we've put these intermediate nodes in. So we have the sensor nodes, we have internal nodes, which are these intermediate nodes that mediate uh, sensory information. They Sometimes they combine sensory signals. Sometimes they split them between the effect, you know, to different, uh, from different sources to multiple effectors. And you can increase the number of these nodes and, and thus increase the number of these connections. And we have a CGS kernel here, and that, that is our representation rich model. And notice that it's integrated into one of the layers here. Now, this is what I was talking about when I talked about how we achieve the layering. In this case, I'm going to show it as part of this internal node structure, but it could also lay on top of the agent as well. And so the CGS kernel is embedded amongst these internal nodes, and the CGS kernel transforms signals into fuzzy combinations, the probabilistic signals, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. This is a, a more advanced or more developed version of our DBV, and you can see again, we have the sensor nodes and the effector nodes, those don't change, but the internal nodes change their density quite a bit. And so we, grow, we can grow DV brain, DVB brains in two ways. And the first way, of course, is this genetic algorithms approach. So in this 
In this slide, we can see that the vehicle interacts in a world. And on the upper right, you can see the screenshot that defines the fitness function. So as these agents move around the world, their fitness changes, and that denote, you know, that tells the agent whether it's doing well or not. And so we generate these embodied topologies. So the agents uh, regenerate and they have offspring and they, the offspring have these different topologies and they have different shapes depending on how the matrix is permutated. And so we get a lot of these samples of different topologies that we might use in the natural world here in our, in our environment. And then the genetic algorithm is used to take the behavioral feedback in terms of the fitness function, the different brains that are generated through evolutionary means, and evaluate them and create new versions of DVBs that we can use in an environment. So the DVBs generate these rudimentary behaviors, characterizes love, aggression, or happiness. Um, but in the uh, in your typical Breitenberg vehicle, these behaviors have often been defined because they look like emotional affinities. So, for example, the love behavior is classified as such because it looks like it's it loves its stimulus or something like that. Those aren't based on a formal representation. They're just kind of like eyeball approximations. So how do we achieve richer, more robust symbolic behaviors and might more accurately characterize behavior, the behaviors that we're classifying them as? So one way we can do that is through contextual integration. And so this is just using our developmental Breitenberg vehicle. In the heavy and learning, and we use heavy and learning to achieve this. So in this heavy and learning example, we have two sensory modalities that are used to establish associative learning. So we have an odor and a taste. And as you can see from the bottom right, we have just spatial distributions of these sensory inputs. And the odor and the taste can be distributed in space differentially. And so the, way, the reason you'd want to do that is to actually train the agent in a way that's sort of predictive. So associative learning is the basis for development of plasticity, and it enables this connectivity, activation, and coding. But it also allows us to play with the inputs in different ways so that you can actually get the agent to distinguish between two different uh, sensory inputs and maybe find the differential relationships between odor and taste and helps the agent to learn. Uh, another way we can do this is through chromotaxis. And so chromotaxis are, it's a version of phototaxis. So phototaxis is where if the agent sees a light source, it's either attracted to it or repulsed by it. In chromotaxis, the agent is attracted to a specific color. And so it can be, it's more developed than phototaxis, and it actually operates more of as a preference. So it's sort of a continuum of an emotional valence. So the you know, the agent might like purple much more than it likes blue. And so it can distinguish between those. Um, so to do this, we have to create the, what we call a cultural representation. And so this is a uh, use of the word culture, and we'll talk about why we use the word culture. But basically what the agent will do is sample this color space at different points, as you can see on the right. And you take in the color information plus the spatial information, and you integrate those things and you build a, map, a representation of it. Um, one note about the color representation, of course, at the bottom is that the sampling density of your red, green, and blue channels determine how the physical continuum, which you can see in the corresponding colors, uh, are included in this cultural representation. So the black bars are the places where our agent is sampled and the Colored bars are the physical sort of range of values that, that are possible. And so you can see that the color, that the cultural representation is not exactly representative of the physical instantiation, but that's kind of what we're hoping for because we want to base these representations on sort of preferences or on, in terms of like some sort of representation of meaning and symbolism. And so the representation rich part of the model then we use these cgs models or contextual geometric structures and i've cited it up here uh, for you I've, i presented that at a life about eight years ago uh, it includes a soft classif classificatory kernel 
which uses fuzzy logic to classify things. So we're dealing not with probabilities, but with degrees of membership in a membership function. And so we can have things like if a stimulus is halfway between light and dark, we can define absolute light, absolute dark, and then we can find a membership function within that continuum. So the agent might sample something that's 50% light and 50% dark. And so it can have attributes of both in that way. And this is based on a structuralist view of, of uh, actually culture. So cultural relationships, according to the structuralists, are a series of overarching structures. It'd be binary opposition or dynamically changing symbols. And structures are actually the key to cultural representation. So these are things that operate above our cognitive, uh, immediate cognitive world that shape our relationship with nature, kinship, and the ritual world. And so this is an attractive way of modeling it if you want to get a handle on sort of, you know, the world that the agent is embedded in or the contextual world that it shares with its other agents. And so these are conceptual automata. And this is actually inspired a little bit by the concept of the habitus by Pierre Bordeaux. And in, in that book, Logic of Practice, Pierre Bordeaux talks about these durable transposable dispositions that are generative and organizes practices and representations adaptively. And so that, that, that's kind of his idea of practice, but our computational objective is much more straightforward. It's a scheme that transforms physical phenomena into operations that can be compared in an evolutionary context. And so how do we represent sensory information to perform cultural operations that make these, these symbols, uh, we can build like a representational scheme around these symbols. And so we use these uh, representationally rich and tuple surfaces uh, that gives us all possible combinations uh, of representation for dealing with things like actions, objects, and the environment. Uh, so we ask the question, what is the membership of cultural phenomena X in this space? And so we can actually, you know, look at things like, you know, how to use chopsticks or what this mask means or what the stop sign means and we can build a representational world around it. Uh, our representations in CGS rely on soft or fuzzy classification. So the important thing to note here is that it does not require transitivity, distributivity, or symmetry, which are hallmarks of your typical uh, statistical or computational models that are classical in nature. So you don't have these sorts of relationships. On the other hand, it allows for um, you know, different type of representation. So I'm going to walk through a representation here to kind of show you how these things work. Um, so we go back to our color space again, our GMB, and we uh, build three categories or three membership functions around the transitions between these colors. So for example, we have R, we have G, and we have B. And then we have uh, changes over time towards one end or the other. So when you have, you notice that the color values, we use a 8-bit color channel for each color component. So uh, zero value is no membership in that. 255 is uh, full membership in, in that category. And so we, could, we have these uh, changes in, you know, green changes in blue, changes in red. And we're just using three membership functions here for simplicity. We can see that as you increase the number of, amount of green in your sample, that you, the color that you sample, you gain membership in this G uh, category. There's also one running from B to G, but we don't have that shown here. You gain membership in that category as your object becomes greener or becomes bluer, you gain membership in this plus B category and so on and so forth. And so, this generates a bunch of points in this in this triangular representation here. And then we have a secondary representation. So now we have object shape. So we have shape and color. And we're linking those two things in the space. And so we have we in this case we're going from a square to a circle. So we're going from something with four sides to a circle, which if you know that you cut the corners on a square recursively, you end up with something that approximates a circle. And we're just saying that. If you sample it many, many, many times over, resample it, you get a circle. And so this, again, this increases your membership in this polygon category. And so as the thing becomes more circular or gains sides, 
it, be, it increases its membership in the polygon function. And so what's interesting about this is that these two uh, types of representation sort of in the same space allows us to go in, in inside this volume and intersect the points. So we have a bunch of points sampled in, in color space and we have a bunch of points sampled in shape space and we can intersect those inside this volume and we can gain in, information about the intersection of those things. We can build rep, you know distances, representational distances and the like. So we can associate things that might not be easily associable by a Brandenburg vehicle. We can build that into this representation. It depends on how you set up the representation, of course, but we can build this capacity in and then commu the, communicate that back to the developmental Brandenburg vehicle. So future directions. Um, so there are a number of future directions we're exploring. Uh, we're looking at the, always looking at this integration of model types in the hybrid model. So how are DBVs and CGS models integrated? as layers, as I showed in the in the first example, or as parallel systems where they're just simply, there's maybe a CGS layer on top of the entire Brainbird vehicle so that every node in the Brainbird vehicle communicates directly with the CGS. That's something we haven't worked out yet, but this is something for future research. We can also model cumulative and collective behavior. So on the left is an example of a set of cumulative behaviors that have been trained using Brainbird vehicles. This is the work of, um, Ankit Gupta, where we have these agents that look at this image and it's either repulsed by the image or attracted to the image. And this is based on the vehicle's topology, the, the vehicle type. Um, and they all sort of behave independently. They're not communicating with each other, but they're still for, you know, forming these sort of flocks or masses of agents that look very much like collective behavior we don't call it collective behavior because they don't communicate with one another. But uh, this this is very the key to like understanding the behavior of social groups of these agents. And so that's another step in, in the future. Uh, we also, if we talk about the metabrain model more generally, there are alternatives to using DBVs and CGSs. So developmentally, Bradenburg vehicles are representationally sparse, but they're embodied. So could we find another type of model like that that has an embodied component, but is also representationally sparse? Could we use something like embodied deep learning or developmentally inspired agent-based modeling to substitute for this? Perhaps, and we could compare those models in terms of performance. Um, and, and a word on CGS is that, is that they're representationally rich, but they're limited in scope. It depends really on your application. So could another model such as ideological models, like, you know, ideological modeling or cultural algorithms work even better than that? And so, again, we're dealing with things that are um, alternates to the CGS, but they serve the same role. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I'd like to say our, our research group, Representational Brains and Phenotypes, is a, a open source project. So you might want to attend our Saturday morning neurosim meetings, which are open to the public. Yeah, thanks to Google Summer of Code in 2018 and 2019 for funding this research. And you can contribute to our GitHub repo on metabrain models at this URL on the bottom. And thank you for your